Hi everybody, my name's Mr Barlow. Welcome to episode 26 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 3, Area of Study 1, and it explains some of the biochemical processes in cells. In particular, the action of enzymes and two key biochemical reactions, photosynthesis and cellular respiration. If you'd like to know more about any of the topics discussed, just click on the links that appear in the iTunes album art throughout the episode. All living things need organic compounds and energy in order to survive. And different organisms get these things in different ways. So some organisms, they just eat food to get that stuff, and they're called heterotrophs. But other organisms actually build the organic compounds from simple inorganic compounds, such as carbon dioxide and water, by using an external energy source, which is usually sunlight. And those organisms are called autotrophs. So autotrophs make their own food, they're also called producers, whereas heterotrophs eat their own food, and they're also called consumers. Chemical reactions are constantly occurring in the cells of living things, and these reactions can be broadly classified into two different categories. There's endergonic reactions, and these are reactions that use up or require energy, and there's exergonic reactions, and these are reactions that release or generate energy. Now photosynthesis is an anabolic reaction, meaning that it constructs large organic molecules from smaller units. And because it uses energy in the form of ATP to do it, it's also an endergonic reaction. Cellular respiration, on the other hand, breaks down large organic molecules into smaller units. And when this happens, it generates energy in the form of ATP. So cellular respiration is an exergonic reaction. Some chemical reactions occur quickly, but some chemical reactions occur slowly. Interestingly, we can speed up the rate of a chemical reaction using something called a catalyst. Now in biology, catalysts are called enzymes. So an enzyme is a biological catalyst. Now enzymes are made of proteins, and while many enzymes are pure proteins, some enzymes require the presence of another factor as well as the protein. These non-protein parts are called cofactors. And sometimes the cofactor is an organic molecule, such as a vitamin. In this case, it's called a coenzyme. And in enzymatic reactions, the molecules at the beginning of the process are called substrates. So the enzyme converts the substrates into different molecules called products. Interestingly, although enzymes participate in biochemical reactions, they're not used up in the process. So basically, they're available for reuse. Now enzymes don't just race around organisms willy-nilly speeding up chemical reactions, they're highly specific in their action. So each enzyme only acts on a particular substrate. And they do this because they've got a particular shape. So each enzyme has a different shape. In particular, the shape of an enzyme at a region known as its active site fits specifically with part of the substrate molecule it acts on. Now enzyme activity can be affected by several factors. For example, the amount of enzyme or the amount of substrate that there is in a cell can make it go faster or slower. They're affected by pH, uh, so they need a specific pH to work correctly. And they're also affected by temperature. For example, at high temperatures, because enzymes are proteins, they're permanently denatured and they don't work anymore. And lastly, because enzymes have such highly specific active sites, if another molecule was to bind to that site, it would basically decrease the enzyme's activity. So these molecules are called enzyme inhibitors, and they can be useful in things like drug design. Arguably, one of the most important chemical reactions on Earth is photosynthesis. Now this is the process in which light energy is transformed into chemical energy stored in sugars. And the simplified chemical equation for photosynthesis is, 6 carbon dioxides plus 12 waters goes to, in the presence of light, glucose plus 6 oxygen molecules plus 6 water molecules. And in plants and algae, this reaction occurs in chloroplasts in cells. This is because the main light-trapping pigments, 
called chlorophylls, are located on the grana membranes in the chloroplasts. So photosynthesis is actually a two-stage process. There's a light-dependent stage and a light-independent stage. The light-dependent stage involves the trapping of light energy on the grana membranes inside chloroplasts. So then, this light energy is used to produce ATP and also to split water, or H2O, into oxygen and hydrogen ions. Those hydrogen ions are then gathered up by a carrier molecule called NADP. Now in stage two, or the light independent stage, the energy trapped in the first stage is used to make organic compounds from carbon dioxide and water. So this stage, it's also called the Calvin cycle. Carbon dioxide, as well as the ATP and the hydrogen ions generated in the first stage, are used to produce a molecule containing three carbon atoms called PGAL, or phosphoglyceraldehyde. This compound is then the starting point for molecules like glucose, fructose and sucrose, so those, those organic molecules you've heard of before. Interestingly, two kinds of plants, C3 and C4 plants, use different chemical reactions in photosynthesis. So C4 plants, a series of chemical reactions precedes the Calvin cycle. And those C4 plants can pick up and use more carbon dioxide more efficiently than C3 plants. And they can carry out photosynthesis at a much higher rate. So that's photosynthesis. It's a two-stage process, a light-dependent stage and a light-independent stage, also called the Calvin cycle. So plants can convert the light energy from the sun into chemical energy stored in glucose. Interestingly, the energy stored in glucose is not used directly by cells. The energy is actually transferred to other compounds, typically ATP, before it can be used. The series of energy releasing reactions or exergonic reactions that break down organic compounds like glucose to release chemical energy and transfer it to ATP is actually called cellular respiration and it too is a hugely important chemical reaction or really series of chemical reactions. So basically cellular respiration transfers the chemical energy stored in glucose to chemical energy stored in ATP. An ATP is formed when adenosine diphosphate or ADP reacts with inorganic phosphate to form adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Interestingly, only about 40% of the chemical energy present in glucose is transferred to ATP. So that basically that means that the other 60% appears as heat energy. So living things generate heat. Now, there are actually two types of cellular respiration. There's aerobic and anaerobic cellular respiration. So aerobic respiration requires oxygen. It's got a slower rate of ATP production but mammals can sustain it indefinitely, so it'll just keep happening and happening. It won't stop. Um, it produces between 36 and 38 molecules of ATP, and the end products are carbon dioxide and water. So that's aerobic respiration. In anaerobic respiration, oxygen's not required, so it just basically breaks down glucose. It results in rapid ATP production, but mammals can only sustain it over a short period of time. So only in short bursts can they do anaerobic respiration. And in anaerobic respiration, only two molecules of ATP are produced. And again, it's different in the products. So the products of anaerobic respiration in humans are lactate and water, whereas in some organisms like yeast, the products are ethanol and carbon dioxide. So that's anaerobic respiration. Now the reaction for aerobic cellular respiration is often written down as glucose plus six oxygens goes to six carbon dioxides plus six waters plus 36 to 38 ATP molecules. But that's actually a simplification of what happens. Aerobic respiration can actually be divided into three stages. Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle and electron transport. Now the first stage of aerobic respiration is glycolysis. So during glycolysis, one molecule of glucose is broken down into two molecules of pyruvate. 
So glucose has got six atoms of carbon, but pyruvate's only got three atoms of carbon. And during this, a net release of energy occurs, and some of this straight away, some of this energy is used to produce two molecules of ATP. Also during glycolysis, hydrogen atoms are removed from glucose and collected by acceptor molecules called NAD. So once NAD's got a hydrogen, it becomes NADH. So briefly, during glycolysis, one molecule of glucose is broken down into two molecules of pyruvate, two molecules of ATP are generated, and NAD becomes NADH. Now the second stage of aerobic respiration is called the Krebs cycle. So the reactions of the Krebs cycle occur in the inner compartment of mitochondria, and for each molecule of pyruvate that passes through this cycle, three molecules of carbon dioxide are formed. And the Krebs cycle also generates two molecules of ATP. So pyruvate's got three carbons in it, and it's converted into three molecules of carbon dioxide. Now the third stage of aerobic respiration is called electron transport. So during electron transport, electrons from loaded acceptors like NADH or FADH are brought to the inner membranes of the mitochondria. So these electrons which are brought there are then transferred to oxygen by special molecules called cytochromes. So when oxygen combines with some electrons, it becomes negatively charged and then a negatively charged oxygen reacts with hydrogen ions to form water. So oxygen and hydrogen makes H2O, water. So this is electron transport and it releases energy. In general, for each pair of electrons transferred down the electron transport chain, enough energy is released to make two or three molecules of ATP. But overall, so when we put glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and electron transport together, Overall, in aerobic respiration, one molecule of glucose releases enough energy to produce 36 molecules of ATP. Although, in some cells, like the cells of your heart, liver and kidneys, two additional molecules of ATP are generated to make a total of 38 ATP molecules. So aerobic respiration makes somewhere between 36 and 38 molecules of ATP. <laughs> So now I'll talk a little bit about anaerobic respiration, which is making ATP without any oxygen. So mammals, the muscle tissue of mammals, can switch to anaerobic respiration when the oxygen supply to the muscles cannot keep up with demand. So, for example, if you've been running really fast and you need to create heaps of energy, you need to breathe really fast, but often not enough oxygen gets, in, gets into your muscles. So your muscles just switch to anaerobic respiration automatically. And that's the way you get, <clears throat> keep getting energy. Other organisms, interestingly, live in environments where there's never any oxygen. These organisms are called obligate anaerobes, and they just rely entirely on anaerobic respiration. In fact, if you put them in oxygen, they'll die. And again, there are the other organisms which can switch between aerobic and anaerobic respiration as oxygen concentrations fluctuate, and these organisms are called facultative anaerobes. So in humans, the first stage of anaerobic respiration is the same as the first stage in aerobic respiration. It's glycolysis. So this results in the production of pyruvate. But in the absence of oxygen, an enzyme present in human muscle tissue converts pyruvate to lactate molecules. And the total energy yield for anaerobic respiration in humans is two ATP molecules per glucose molecule. So as another example, in yeast, anaerobic respiration is called fermentation. And during fermentation, pyruvate again is broken down to carbon dioxide and ethanol, which is an alcohol, and the energy yield is once again two molecules of ATP. So living things need cellular respiration to occur to get energy, and for cellular respiration to occur, they need glucose. In humans, glucose travels around in the blood, but as glucose enters cells, the level of glucose in the blood falls. So as this happens, stored glycogen 
is converted to glucose in the liver and released into the bloodstream. So the glucose level, if it goes down because we're using lots of glucose, the liver will convert glycogen to increase the level of blood glucose again. In prolonged fasting in humans, the glycogen stores in the liver run out. And when this happens, fat is released from adipose tissue, which is kind of like fat tissue. And that's transported to the liver where it's converted to glucose. And again, that's released into the bloodstream. So we're talking about when you, know, you haven't eaten for a while. If you don't eat for a really long time, it's called starvation. So when an animal is starved, it obtains its energy from the body tissues themselves as opposed to you know, the glucose in the blood or the food they've just eaten. After the glucose is used up, fats and then protein are used. And during starvation in people, up to 97% of fat tissue, 31% of skeletal muscle and 27% of blood can be lost. Fortunately, the brain, heart and diaphragm are not affected. But once the level of starvation has reached the stage where proteins from muscle and other tissue are being used as an energy source, an animal is in a critical condition. This state is known as autophagia, which basically means feeding off oneself, and it's not very pleasant. But anyway, that delightful thought brings episode 26 of the VCE Biology Podcast to a close. I'm Mr Barlow, and thanks for listening.